Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Williams. Justin, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good, Matt. Glad that it's Friday. I am glad it's Friday too. It seems like it's been one of those weeks that keeps going on. We're a couple of days late releasing this episode, so apologies for that. But we have a, a good one lined up for you. And Justin, I think this is a topic that is not something that most mineral and royalty owners are immediately familiar with. And so I think it's important to have at least an awareness of this topic. And what we're going to talk about is top leasing. We were talking before we hit record that neither of us have um, necessarily been approached to sign a top lease, but we have gotten close to that situation or been in areas where top leasing was going on, but just didn't go through the process of actually doing a top lease. And I know that you're familiar with top leasing from some acreage you have in West Texas. And you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And I I ended up being an unleased co-tenant in that area, but um, that was exactly what happened. There there was another operator that had leased up the area. They never did drill a well. Um, And then another operator came in and offered top leases to a lot of the participants and, and then eventually drilled a well there. And, you know, I think there's a common misconception with leases um, that once an acreage is leased, that's it, it's done, you know, that's all that's available. And that's not necessarily the case. It's much less common, Matt, but that's what we're going to talk about today is top leasing and what is a top lease and a bottom lease. That's exactly right. Well, do you want to dive into that and talk, first of all, what uh, top leasing is? Let's do it. So top leasing is the practice of leasing your mineral rights uh, when there is a valid existing lease already in place. From a legal perspective, the top lease is described as a present grant of a future interest. A typical oil and gas lease can also be referred to as the bottom lease. Bottom lease will typically still be the primary term when the top lease is offered, but that doesn't have to be the case. A less common situation might be where you have an existing bottom lease in the secondary term where your existing wells are no longer producing or are not producing a paying quantities. And the top lease would look to try to force the operator to plug the wells and give up the bottom lease or force them to drill new wells to extend the lease. That's exactly right. And when we say are not producing in paying quantities, that's an important concept to think about because a lot of times operators will let wells trickle on. They'll be like basically a stripper well producing like a barrel or two a month. And all they're doing in that situation is really just extending the life of that well so that they can keep that lease held by production. And in that situation, it might be more economic for them to keep losing a small amount of money each month to keep producing that well so that those leases are held by production. Because if they have to plug and abandon the well, then they have to go back and pay you know, lease bonuses to all of the folks that have minerals in that area and probably have to lease for less favorable terms than the existing oil and gas leases, especially if they've been in place for, you know, 40, 50 years, they might have a one eighth royalty currently. If they were to have to lease again, they would have to lease at a 25% royalty if that was the going rate, for example, in like uh, the Delaware Basin, where that is kind of the common theme right now. So they're incentivized to keep those wells trickling along And there are a lot of times speculators that will come in and try to top lease and sort of force the operator's hand in this case. And what they're trying to do, and most of the time trying to get them to bust the lease, basically, that's kind of a term you'll hear kind of from a landman. If you're approached to top lease, they'll say, hey, we're going to try to get the operator to bust lease because these wells aren't producing and paying quantities. We're going to make them plug the wells and, and let those leases expire. And, you know, that is something that could be a strategy in an area where it's super competitive, it's very hot, and it's hard to go in right after the lease expires and then be successful at leasing that acreage. So by top leasing, they're getting an option to lease that acreage. They're sort of locking in that option. Should the bottom lease expire, then they can come in and get a a top lease in place. and, And that would be a strategy that's used. And it certainly can be effective, Justin. 
Absolutely. You know, and that's um, not uncommon, the scenario you're talking about where you've got people holding those leases. I, in West Texas, it is extremely common. In New Mexico, it's really common. And so, yeah, it's effective strategy. And there's a couple different examples of when this can come to play. And one is a two-party. So that's when you have that existing lease and the lessee presents a top lease on the existing acreage so it doesn't expire. And they're looking to protect their leasehold interest to make sure that if that lease was to expire, then another operator can't come in and dilute their interest in a potential drilling unit. And then there's the third-party lease. So in this situation, you have the bottom lease with company A that is still in the primary term, typically, but doesn't have to be. And you're approached by company B to sign a top lease for the same acreage. But in this case, the lease does not go into effect until the lease with company A expires. Company B might offer to pay you a percentage up front, say 10% of the lease bonus. And then if the lease with company A expires, then they will pay you the remaining 90% to secure the top lease. Then it would be like any other situation where your middle rights are leased at that point. Yeah, I think that's important to keep in mind is that when we talk about top lease, this is not some different type of lease when it goes into effect. Effectively, it's another oil and gas lease. It's the top lease is just because it's you're being leased on top of an existing oil and gas lease. And so it's just talking about the time element associated with it. It's sort of an option that you're signing, basically. And again, like Justin mentioned, I think it's important to note that this isn't common in every area. You know, it's really in the areas that are extremely hot. You know, I think the Permian Basin, Delaware Basin, West Texas, Southeast New Mexico is a common area where this is being done. I saw it in practice in the early 2010s, around 2011 in Pennsylvania with the Marcellus Shale, when that was really heating up and when I was working on a project in that area. And again, it's companies trying to stake their claim and basically trying to secure a position there. And, and oftentimes, you know, it can be like Justin mentioned, another operator that wants to come in and drill and they see that the existing operator or existing lessee is uh, not on a timeline to drill wells before the primary term expires. So what they want to do is secure the acreage. And so it's just sort of like a competitive situation where you get into top leasing. And like Justin said, the the example that he gave, the first example, the two-party lease, it's where your existing lessee comes in and, and tries to get you to sign a top lease uh, on top of their existing lease. And, and this would be a situation where maybe they don't have permits in place or they don't see that they're going to be ready to drill on that acreage before the original lease expires. And in this situation where they're top leasing, it would be where they don't have an option in place to extend the lease. So sometimes when you sign a lease, there'll be a three-year primary term with an option to extend it for an additional two years by payment of additional lease bonus at that point, usually 100% or sometimes more of that original lease bonus. Top leasing is, is very similar to that in that it's effectively, after that oil and gas lease is in effect, they're approaching you to say, hey, we're going to add an option on top of that lease effectively. And so the the new lease that you get, you would have to renegotiate the terms all over again to make sure you get the terms that you want. And then also negotiate the payment for that top lease. And a lot of times there'll be like a deposit or a down payment that the company will pay you, like Justin said, and it might be 10% of the lease bonus. It could be more. You could negotiate more to say, hey, I, you know, I want 20% or whatever it is. And you get that no matter what. So that's basically just to have this option in place, we're going to pay you 10% of the lease bonus now. And then if the bottom lease should expire and the top lease goes into effect, we'll pay you the remaining 90% or whatever the remaining percentage is. And so that lease bonus in that case is split up into two payments, one initial sort of down payment or deposit that even if that top lease doesn't go into effect, you get to keep that. And then the other part would be contingent upon the top lease going into effect. So Justin, it can be a situation where if you're able to renegotiate better terms, it could be a reason to go after a top lease. Maybe you had a lease in place and you thought, well, you know, it was good at the time, but you know, things have really heated up since then. Companies are offering better terms and maybe I should be able to take advantage of that. And it would be like any other situation. If you think you're 
existing bottom lease is going to expire and you're going to go through the process of leasing again, you'd want to treat that top lease situation as if you're negotiating a new bottom lease. So you'd still want to go through the process of reviewing the terms, having an attorney review that if it makes sense, negotiating the clauses that you want, good royalty rate, lease bonus that you're happy with. But just know that by getting a top lease, sometimes companies will try to get that done quickly. And so they're trying to circumvent the open market situation where you're going out and getting multiple offers and you know taking your time. And, and so that's one thing you'd want to make sure that you still do is take your time, review the language, potentially get multiple offers and see what you can get so that you get the best rate you know, in terms of the royalty rate and then no post-production costs, other clauses that you want to get in there, just like any other lease. So I think that's important to think about when you go into a top leasing situation. You nailed it, Matt. And I think, you know, for mineral right owners, it's easy for this conversation to kind of confuse you. And when they start talking about top leases, it's easy to think, oh, this is an addition to what I have going on. And, you know, you just got to be careful that you're not accepting less, you're all of those fun things. And those terms are there. So some pros of top leases, Matt, as you mentioned, you get to release your acreage as soon as that existing lease expires, which is nice to know that you're not going to have to go through that process. It could help spur development in a three-party top lease situation because that original lessee runs the risk of losing their leasehold position, at least for your interest in, and maybe others, if that's what they're doing in the area. It presents an opportunity to negotiate a lease with better terms. And as Matt just said, if you have a lease that has a lower royalty rate or allows post-production charge, it might be a great opportunity to kind of renegotiate that, set it in stone, knowing that this other lease is, is going to be expiring. And then you get money up front as a deposit. And then for the option to secure a top lease, you know, 10% of the lease bonus, maybe 20%, you can negotiate there. And if the bottom lease extends into the secondary term by the operator drilling a well, you're still held by the bottom lease. So there's no downside if that happens, which is great. And Matt, do you want to talk about some of the cons of leases? Yeah, there are some potential drawbacks of top leasing. Again, if it is something you're approached with, then it's probably because there is a lot of competition. There's a lot of activity in the area where you own minerals. And if you you know, accept the first top lease that you're offered, you're potentially going to be giving up the opportunity to competitively lease your minerals. In other words, to get multiple offers to play those offers off of each other to get the best terms possible. And so if you don't actively negotiate the top lease, you could end up with less favorable terms than you could have gotten otherwise. Because again, top leasing isn't common in an area where there's not a whole lot going on. They'll just wait for the the bottom lease to expire and then they'll come back in and approach you to sign another bottom lease basically, rather than having to spend money that could be at risk if the bottom lease gets held by production and goes into the secondary term, because at that point, that money is gone for the company that top leased your interest. So that's something to think about. And then the other thing too, is, is the top lease with a reputable company. You know, A lot of these top leasing situations can be with companies that are trying to get in and, and force the operator to break the ex- existing bottom lease, because uh, like we mentioned at the beginning, Maybe there's a well that's producing, but it's not producing in paying quantities. And so they're going to try to force that um, previous lease to go away just because they can maybe litigate it or go that route. So just know that the top leasing, you know, if it's not a company you've heard of, if it's not a reputable company, you know, you could be caught in the middle potentially of litigation if there's a conflict between the top lessee and the bottom lessee. And so we'll talk a little bit more how that could happen and, and, you know, when top leasing can cause problems here in a second, but just some things to think about in terms of potential drawbacks of top leasing. You nailed it, Matt. And as listeners can imagine, top leasing is is maybe not the favorite thing of whoever the operator is that has that bottom lease or person holding the bottom lease. And so a right of first refusal is something that you see in leases sometimes, and that prevents you from being top leased. And that language gives the original lessee the option to match the terms of the top lease to extend the lease and pursue it to the terms of the top lease. And really, you know, Matt, they're just looking to protect their leasehold interest. And the language reads basically that if there is an bona fide offer that comes from that third party, that they get a chance to compete with that. 
And I'm sure many operators would love to have that chance. And, and again, they're just worried about losing their acreage. And Matt, you kind of alluded to some problems that can happen with top leasing. And, you know, there's an interesting situation which can come up. And, you know, during a two-party top lease situation, uh, like we talked about before, it becomes a question about overriding royalty obligations. If you've got uh, overriding royalties burning that bottom lease, one of the questions is whether that top lease extinguishes the overriding royalty interest or you know, if those overriding royalty interests continue. And Matt, that's a, a straight road to litigation. I can see how that would really stir it up. Yeah, it could definitely stir the pot, especially if you're one of the holders of the overriding royalty interest. And the way that they determine whether or not that should happen, it depends on how that overriding royalty was granted to the, to the person. So it's sort of on a case-by-case basis is my understanding, just from reading some of the legal journals on this topic. So that is important to think about. Now, there there is something that also you, you need to keep in mind with that language in a bottom lease. So just kind of taking a step back and thinking about if we're approached to sign an oil and gas lease, we don't have an existing lease in place. The clause that Justin mentioned, that right of first refusal clause or that language, it's something to be aware of. You know, There's people that say, oh, you should try to cross that out and you should not let them do that. I think it maybe is not the end of the world because at the end of the day, you're if you're happy with the lessee that you signed the original lease with, if you're offered a top lease, then there's not potentially a drawback to just having that lease extend with them. But just know that if you're accepting that right of first refusal language, like Justin mentioned, it basically what you'll see in there is language, something that says during the primary term of the lease, if you read a if you receive a bona fide offer from a third party to purchase a lease covering any or all of the substances covered by this lease and covering all or a portion of the lease premises with the lease to become effective upon the expiration of this lease, then basically the thing that I see in there a lot of times is you're supposed to notify the original lessee in writing of that offer immediately, including the notice and the name and address of the company offering you the top lease, the price and all the terms and conditions, et cetera. And then they have the right for a certain period of time after that to get back to you to purchase the top lease basically and, and to extend your existing lease through a top lease. And so it goes from a, a three-party top lease situation to a two-party top lease situation if they extend your lease and take that option. Now, putting that language in there, you're giving the company an option to extend your lease basically. So even if you negotiate just a three-year term with no extension, if you have this right of first refusal language, you're effectively allowing them the option to extend your lease if somebody else comes in and tries to lease that acreage uh, through a top lease. All that to say, there's an option, I think, to negotiate this term out. So if you try to negotiate out this language and they say, no, we need to have that in there, then say, okay, well, then give me something in return for that, You know, maybe a little bit more in lease bonus or you know, better language in terms of no post-production cost or higher royalty rate. So just try to think about this term as a trade-off. You know, if you allow it to be included in your bottom lease, it's something you can try to get some additional language added to the lease that's more favorable to you or get more in the terms of lease bonus. So think about that as a negotiating strategy. So that's a potential tip that you can use. And like Justin said, I think that the top leasing can cause problems. Really, it's when there's a three-party top lease situation where that lease has been extended. It's pretty cut and dry if there is a top lease situation where the original lease expires at the end of the primary term. They don't drill a well. They're not doing any sort of activity in the field that could potentially push that lease into the secondary term. And in that case, it's really cut and dry. There's not that big of a a deal. The issue gets in where, again, like we mentioned earlier, if that bottom lease doesn't expire and then the top lessee comes in and drills a well after the end of the primary term of the bottom lease, thinking that it did expire, uh, whereas it hadn't. And then you can get into a situation where that top lessee is uh, being found in a trespass situation. So in other words, they don't have a valid oil and gas lease, but they're going in and drilling. And so that's where the litigation has come up in the past where 
again, there's that stripper well that's barely holding it. And it's really up to the courts to decide, you know, is this lease in effect or is it not? And that's when it can get real messy. And then you're kind of caught in the middle because nothing's going to happen in terms of drilling on your on your minerals until that gets litigated, until the courts decide who's in the right and who's in the wrong and who actually has a valid lease. And so that could just delay the process of getting a well drilled. So again, that's when you want to be aware of the potential situation of, of, of allowing that to happen. And so maybe in that case, you could, instead of having the top lessee, try to force the operator's hand. There's nothing to prevent you from approaching the existing operator and saying, hey, we want you to release our lease. We believe that the well isn't producing in paying quantities. And then you can have your attorney send them a letter or whatever, you know, to sort of force them to make a move, whether that's to drill a new well and to kind of move forward with drilling additional wells. And, you know, that's benefit to you because you get additional royalties or to plug and abandon that existing well, and then which will allow you to release those interests. So if you're in that situation, I think it, there maybe is some additional risk to signing a top lease. If you have an existing well that's producing, your existing bottom lease is in the secondary term, a top lease on top of that can get kind of tricky. So just be aware of that before you go through the process of signing a top lease. Absolutely, Matt. And you know, on your side, if you're signing a top lease, something you can't do is sign that top lease and then go back and extend that lease with the operator that had the original bottom lease. That would be a real quick way to end up in the lawsuit that Matt just explained there. And though tempting, definitely not something you want to do. And, and title work should prevent that. But you know, again, be wary of that and not good moves. Yeah. You might be enticed by, oh, hey, I got this new offer. It's better. I'm going to sign with this other company and then I'll just go back and tell the previous company that, no, I'm not going to accept your check. And in the meantime, they've already recorded that lease and it's a done deal. And they're like, no, we've, what are you talking about? We've already got a lease with you. So don't put yourself in that situation. You know, at the end of the day, if you're approached to sign a lease, you should take the time to negotiate it, to get the terms that you want. And if you're worried about that happening, then you can add what's called a favored nations provision to your lease. And basically what that allows for is that if another lease is offered to, let's say your neighbor, and it has better terms or higher compensation in terms of a lease bonus, that you have the option to go back to the uh, lessee to get those same terms. And so it'll specify specifically, you know, what the terms are more favorable with respect to lease bonus, royalty, or any of those types of clauses. And you can make, you can adjust it to however you want, but that is something that you can do. And, and sometimes that can be a strategy that if you have a small interest and you don't have a lot of time to negotiate specific clauses in there that you could just add in a favored na nation's provision. And then you can go back and once other leases have been offered and you know, higher royalty rates, et cetera, you could go back to the operator and get those same provisions, you know, with your lease. So that is a way that you can prevent having to get into a situation where you get kind of seller's remorse, so to speak, in this case, where you give up more than you should have, or you accepted a lower lease bonus or a lower royalty rate. So the, that would be the preferable way to handle that would be to add a favored nation's provision to your lease rather than trying to sign another lease and then trying to break the first lease. So you want to make sure that you don't get into a situation where there's ambiguity as to what lease is in effect, you know, basically at the end of the day. So yeah, I think there's pros and cons, Justin, I think, you know, for sure can be a good strategy if you are approached to top lease to try to force the operator's hand in terms of drilling, trying to get them to do something sooner than later. And, uh, you know, one way you might do that is say, hey, I'm going to sign a top lease unless you can show that you're in the process of drilling. So it could be an opportunity to get a better lease and to get the operator to do something sooner than later in terms of drilling a new well. Absolutely, Matt. I couldn't agree more. You know, top leases are not something that you see a whole lot, but um, definitely something to be aware of as a mineral rights owner. If you're approached with that, you know, it can be a little bit deceiving, uh, but it's definitely something to take your time and treat just as you would a normal lease. Yep. I couldn't have said it any better. And on that note, that is all for this episode. So 
we'll link to some resources in the show notes where you can read more about this and the legal perspective around top leasing if you are in this situation. Again, like we always recommend, hire uh, a competent attorney that is licensed to practice in the state where you have minerals because ultimately you're negotiating a contract. And to the extent that it makes financial sense for you to do so, it's always good to have an attorney review the language that you're uh, agreeing to, to make sure that you're getting what you think. So thanks again for listening. And thanks, Justin. Thanks, Pat. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.